What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Open your Bible, if you will, to Mark chapter 2, and uh, we're going to embark upon the opening twelve verses of this chapter, one of the more wonderful and memorable stories of the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus. Before we look at the uh, account of these twelve verses, however, I, I want to get a little bit of a running start. It may seem like a question with an obvious answer, but sometimes things aren't as obvious as they ought to be for some, and so let me ask it anyway. What is the most distinctive benefit that Christianity has to offer the world? What is the most distinctive benefit that Christianity has to offer the world? I suppose there would be a lot of suggested answers. There are some people who, uh, who think the great legacy of Christianity is a kind of morality, a, a kind of ethical approach to life. There are others who think that the great legacy of Christianity is that it provides a, a certain kind of love and sacrificial affection for people, social responsibility. Others think that it provides a kind of tranquility in life that they call peace. There are some who think that what Christianity really offers people is fulfillment in life or a sense of satisfaction or purpose. Summing it all up, uh, there are folks who think that Christianity's, Christianity's greatest benefit is to provide people a measure of religious happiness. Well, I would agree with you that there is contained in the pages of Scripture a moral standard, an ethical standard. I agree with you that Christians are marked by love and peace and happiness. I agree with you that Christians express social responsibility uh, based upon a higher motivation than any other people, and there is amazing fulfillment, purpose, and satisfaction in Christianity. But none of those is the great benefit of Christianity. Those are simply byproducts of the great benefit. There is one great benefit that the Christian gospel offers that transcends all other benefits and leads to all other benefits. It is a benefit, frankly, that corresponds directly to man's greatest need. And that is where Christianity marks itself out from all other religions on the planet. It alone addresses man's greatest need. There are religions that offer ethics and morality and social responsibility and family values and a measure of love and peace, somewhat a measure of fulfillment satisfaction, maybe even a certain measure of happiness. But what is man's greatest need? The greatest need of man, simply put, is to escape the wrath of God poured out on sinners eternally in hell. The greatest need of man is to escape the wrath of God poured out eternally on sinners in hell. Only Christianity, only the Christian gospel offers the benefit that meets that need. Only through the Christian gospel can anyone escape the wrath of God poured out on sinners eternally in hell. What sends people to hell? You say sin? No. Uh, it's not sin alone that sends people to hell. It is unforgiven sin. It is unforgiven sin that sends people to hell. Hell is only occupied by people whose sins have never been and will never be forgiven. Heaven, on the other hand, is occupied by people whose sins have all been forgiven. Therefore, what causes people to escape the wrath of God in eternal hell is the forgiveness of their sins. That is man's greatest need to move him from hell to heaven. Christianity alone offers that very benefit, the forgiveness of sins. The greatest need of every soul is divine forgiveness of all sin. And the greatest benefit of Christianity, then, is the provision of that complete forgiveness. God uniquely presents Himself in Scripture as a God who is willing to forgive, who is eager to 
to forgive, who is by nature compassionate, kind, loving, merciful, and seeks to save sinners from His own wrath. This is the message of the Christian gospel. If you have been assuming that the Christian church or the Christian gospel or the Christian religion has any other message than that, you've been wrong. That is the message. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 38, we read, "'Therefore let it be known to you, brethren, that through Him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and it is granted to all those who believe. When you believe the gospel, you receive forgiveness of sins. In Ephesians chapter 1, that familiar statement in verse 7, in Him, that is in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which He lavished on us. That is the message of Christianity. God will forgive your sins. It is God's desire to forgive your sins. Forgiveness is consistent with His nature, not just in the New Testament, but in the Old as well. Back in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, God introduces Himself. This is God speaking about Himself. And He says, "'The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin.'" That is God introducing Himself. In Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 17, we read, "'You are a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness.'" In Psalm 103, verse 12, that memorable statement, "'As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us.'" Isaiah 38, 17 says, "'You have cast all my sins behind Your back.'" Isaiah 43, 25, "'I, even I,' says God, "'I am the one who wipes out Your transgressions for My own sake, and I will not remember Your sins.'" That is amazing. That is amazing. There is nothing more offensive to God than sin because He is absolutely holy, and yet He finds glory in the forgiveness of sinners. Nothing is more godlike than forgiveness. Nothing is more foreign to human nature than forgiveness. Nothing is more alien to us than forgiveness because nothing is more consistent with being sinful than being vengeful. Now, God understands that justice has to be met. God has actually said that it is an abomination for men to justify a sinner. It is equal to the injustice of declaring an innocent person guilty. In Proverbs 17, 15, Scripture says, "'He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord.'" It is an abomination for men to justify those who are wicked, and yet God does it, and God alone does it, because God alone can forgive sin. It is God, according to Romans 4, who justifies the ungodly. How can He do that? He can do that because His justice has been satisfied in the death of Jesus Christ, who is a substitute for the sinner, who dies in the sinner's place. All the sins of all those who will ever repent and believe were placed on Christ and He died in our place, therefore satisfying the justice of God. God's justice being satisfied by a perfect substitutionary sacrifice, God can forgive sinners who repent and believe. And thus those sinners escape hell and are promised eternal heaven. This is the message of the Christian gospel, that Jesus came to forgive sinners. Scripture is very clear that only God can do this. That only God, the one who is the judge and the lawgiver and the executioner, God who is the one offended, is the only one who can forgive. And He does, and He will, and He delights to. 
and He has, and He will continue to do so. This story is about forgiveness. Let's read it. Follow your Bible along from verse 1 as I read. Speaking of Jesus, when He had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that He was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door, and He was speaking the Word to them. And they came, bringing to Him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to Him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above Him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, "'Son, your sins are forgiven.'" But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, "'Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone?' Immediately, Jesus, aware in His Spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, "'Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts?' Which is easier to say to the paralytic, "'Your sins are forgiven,' or to say, "'Get up and pick up your pallet and walk.'" But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, He said to the paralytic, "'I say to you, get up. Pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Now, we're only in the second chapter of Mark, but our Lord has already demonstrated his authority over disease, hasn't he? Over all kinds of diseases. He has demonstrated His authority over demons. They must obey Him. He has demonstrated His authority in teaching by proclaiming the truth and doing it in ways that had never been done before. He has authority over disease. He has authority over demons. He has authority in the realm of truth. Now He wants us to understand that He has authority to forgive sins authority to forgive sins. This is what is at the heart of this unforgettable miracle. Now the story is full of people. It's all about people. So we're going to kind of look at it as though we were looking at it through the characters that play roles in the story. There is the crowd, there is the paralytic, there is the Savior, there are the leaders, and then we return to the crowd at the end. Every story kind of breaks into three parts. You have a setting, you have action, and you have a reaction. As you go through the stories and the the record of the life of our Lord, that's kind of how it is. There's a certain setting which gives meaning to the story. There's the action in the story, then there's the response or the reaction, and that's what we're going to look at. The setting is the curious crowd. The action involves the believing paralytic, the forgiving Savior, and the hostile leaders. The response again from the astonished crowd. Let's work our way through the story. We'll begin with the curious crowd and get the setting. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, uh, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. Now, when he had come back to Capernaum indicates to us that he had been somewhere. He had been somewhere for a period of time, several days had passed. That that is a very broad term. In fact, Luke is equally indefinite. Luke says, and it came about one day, or literally in the Greek, and it happened. Now we know where Jesus has been. Go back to verse 45. He um, could not enter a city, it says in the middle of the verse. Because the man that he had healed from leprosy had been told not to say anything but to be quiet and go all the way to Jerusalem and show himself to the priest and go through the necessary cleansing and sacrifice to reenter society from being an outcast as a leper. He didn't do that. He went everywhere and and just told everybody about the healing and that just stirred up the excitement of the crowds because leprosy was, was the worst of the worst. 
And so instead of obeying Jesus, He spread it everywhere to the extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city but stayed out in unpopulated areas and they were coming to Him from everywhere. He couldn't go into a city because the crush of the people was so overwhelming. Now remember, everywhere He went, He healed everybody. And it just became totally debilitating to Him because of the crush of the crowd of people with all their physical infirmities and needs. Jesus was certainly willing to heal and He did. But what was more important to Him, go back to verse 38 of chapter 1, He said, desiring to leave Capernaum, He was in Capernaum when He said this, let's go somewhere else. Let's leave Capernaum. Why? Because verse 37 says, everyone's looking for you. After His healings there, healings of masses of people, as well as Peter's wife's mother, there was just an inundation of people into His life, and it made it hard for Him to, to preach. Everybody was clamoring to be healed. And so He said, let's go somewhere else, for I have to preach, for that is what I came for. And He went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, all around the lake, preaching and casting out demons. So for weeks, stretching into months, He's been away from Capernaum. And He's been going all over, and He's been healing, and He's been casting out demons, and He has been preaching the glorious gospel of salvation, repentance and faith in God's grace and forgiveness. Now things have cooled down a little bit because He's been out in the wilderness for so long, He feels He can re-enter Capernaum and He won't be completely stifled. So it's time to go back. So Mark says when He had come back to Capernaum several days after completing this tour of the lake area, He comes back to essentially, the end of the verse says, what was home. Uh, the, um, the home for Jesus during His Galilean ministry, which lasted as long as a year and a half, was Capernaum. And very likely He stayed in the home of Simon and Andrew, Peter and Andrew. That was His home base. He comes back to this, the largest town on the lake, trade center, north and south, east, east and west, busy, busy place, Roman garrison there, tax office there, significant place. He comes back. What had He done when He had been gone? Cast out demon, preached. So He comes back. When He arrives at the home of Simon and Andrew, which is where He was staying, verse 2 says, many were gathered together there. That's probably an understatement. There was a mob scene. There was no longer any room for anybody, not even near the door. It was just completely jammed. Now you need to understand something, folks, and this is going to be true through His ministry. Crowds were no measure of ministry success. Crowds were no measure of spiritual success. Never does Mark say the crowds were coming to Jesus in repentance and faith. Never says that. Generally they are curious. That's why I call this first point the curious crowd. They are spiritually passive. They are spiritually indifferent. They are spiritually uncommitted. They want the healing. Like in John 6, they want the food. But they really are not seeking anything spiritual from Jesus in general. There, are, of course, are some true followers and true believers, but they are a small minority. They are the few. The crowd really functions to obstruct Jesus more than anything, to make it difficult for Him to teach because of the clamor of the people who want their physical needs met, because of the crush. If He's on the shore, He has to get in a boat and go offshore just to get some breathing room from the crowds. They make it hard for Him to minister, hard for Him to teach. And even when He's teaching, the interruptions must have been constant, such as this amazing interruption where people start digging through the roof in the middle of your lesson. It's really only in private with His disciples that He explains truth in detail. The crowds are no measure of 
His success. The curious crowds are drawn by the desire for more miracles. They are generally indifferent to Jesus' teaching, except they note the uniqueness of it, such as back in verse 27 where they say it's a new teaching with authority. What is this? We've never heard anything like this, the similar response at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. We've never heard a man speak like this. He speaks with authority. They marked the uniqueness of it, but they were not particularly interested in the spiritual truth of it. Nonetheless, He was speaking the Word to them. The Word means the gospel, the Word from God, the Word about salvation, the Word about the kingdom, entering the kingdom through repentance and faith. It was the same message He gave at Nazareth. And you remember Luke 4 records that He went to Nazareth, His own hometown, gave one message there, told them it was the favorable year of the Lord. He'd come to preach the gospel to the poor, the blind, the oppressed. He'd come to set free the captives. He'd come to proclaim the glorious liberty of salvation. At the end of that sermon, they tried to throw Him off a cliff and kill Him. They had no interest in the spiritual message. They were very deeply offended by it because it was predicated on them recognizing their own wretchedness and sinfulness, spiritual poverty, blindness, lack of liberty, spiritual oppression. They didn't want to see themselves that way. They thought they were the holy. And so He preached that same message surely in Capernaum. As far as we can tell, there wasn't a reaction as there was in Nazareth. They didn't try to kill Him in Capernaum, so He made it His home and stayed there. So there is the curious crowd. By the way, just a footnote, Luke adds the Pharisees were mingled in. The Pharisees were mingled in. comes from a word meaning separated. These are the guardians of the populist form of apostate Judaism. They are the fundamentalist, legalist architects and promoters of salvation by works, salvation by self-righteousness. This is the system that dominated the people. Yeah, they believed in, in the Old Testament. They believed, uh, they believed in resurrection. They believed in angels. They believed in demons. They believed in predestination, human responsibility, written law, oral law. They believed in the coming of Messiah, the Messianic kingdom. They were non-priests. They were lay people. Uh, They were devoted to keeping the people loyal to the Old Testament law and, more importantly, the tradition that a complex set of regulations they had developed that sort of became a wall around the law with the idea that it would protect it and what it did was obscure it and put something in its place. Couldn't see the law anymore. All you could see was the regulations that were around the law. And of course, it was a damning system because no one could be saved by keeping the law. There were only about 6,000 of them, I understand, at this time. But they were pervasive in their influence in the synagogue system throughout the land of Israel. They began after they returned from the Babylonian captivity in the time of Ezra about 400 years before this, and they had developed for 400 years this system of legalistic Judaism that was nothing but apostate. And the Pharisees were mingled in the crowd that day in the house because they had started to dog the steps of Jesus because they were already so concerned with what He was saying. They saw Him as a threat. They wanted to trap Him in some blasphemy so they'd have a reason to execute Him. Now, within the group of the Pharisees, there was also a group called scribes. If you drop down to verse 6, you can see some of the scribes were sitting there also. Now the scribes were the theologians that belonged to the Pharisees' system. The Pharisees were the preachers and teachers of the system. The theologians sort of put it together. They were the scholastics. They were the scholars. Not all scribes were Pharisees. Not all Pharisees were scribes. There were Pharisees that were not scribes. There were scribes that were not Pharisees. There were scribes of the Sadducees. There were independent scribes as well. Jesus would even have been considered a scribe who was completely independent of any of those orders or sects. But the New Testament makes a number of references to the scribes of the Pharisees. Each religious system, whether it was the Essenes or the Sadducees or the Pharisees, had their scholars that put their system together, and certainly the Pharisees had theirs. Some of them were sitting there, according to Luke chapter 5, verse 17. It is the scribes, whether scribes of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, or independent scribes, who were called rabbi, which meant great one. It was a title of honor that they loved to hear. Even Jesus, you remember, was called rabbi. You find that at least five times in the Gospel of John. So they were the teachers and theologians, and they were there as well. They were all there wanting to trap Jesus. 
Luke 5.17 adds something that's not in Mark. Luke says, the power of the Lord was present for Him to perform healing. Remember now, He had restricted Himself to the Holy Spirit's power. The Holy Spirit was there in full power to heal, and so that's why the people were there. They were there for the healings. But Jesus was teaching the curious crowd. And we move from the setting to the action. The action begins with the believing sinner. Let's call Him the believing sinner.